This is a phrase that we often use as a synonym for Vedanta. Eternal principles. For everybody at every stage of life, in whichever circumstance you find yourself, we will benefit from greater empathy and greater self-sufficiency. All very well and good. But how do you get there? So the next poem which touches on that is The Daffodils by William Wordsworth. What we're talking about here is an effect. Right? And the world is an expression of cause and effect. So if this growth is the effect that we're talking about, the cause are the three spiritual practices. The three yogas. Yoga means to unite. Yoga is a spiritual practice. So the practices are given at each of the levels of the personality, the body, the mind, and the intellect. So the first of the spiritual disciplines is the path of action, the yoga of action. So chapter 3 of the Bhagavad Gita is entitled the yoga of action. 43 verses. William Wordsworth dispenses with a single line, I wandered lonely as a cloud. Six words. The whole path of action is encompassed in this. So he says, I wandered. What does wandering refer to? I'll give you a hint, it's on the board. No attachment to place. If I'm wandering, think of a, uh, a nomad. The wandering nomad. Or in India you have this idea of the wandering mendicant. No attachment to a place. There's no home. Attachment is always used in the pejorative sense. You can replace it, in fact, with the word dependency. So I wandered means I don't have any dependency or attachment to a particular place. I'm like a nomad. I wandered lonely means no attachment to a particular person or people. doesn't mean the absence of love. It means the absence of dependency. So lonely doesn't mean a sense of isolation and sadness. It means being self-sufficient to not depend upon the company of others for your well-being. Which is all very well and good. I'm fine, I don't need place, I don't need people, but I could wander around the place being a nuisance. No, no, this fellow wanders lonely as a cloud. What does a cloud do? gives rain and without rain no plants without plants no food without food no beings no you no me so a cloud is essential it gives and gives so that we may flourish and in the process it gives itself away the epitome of selfless action you remember the three types of action selfish unselfish selfless Karma Yoga is what? Without attachment to place or to person, serve the world selflessly. There's your Karma Yoga. 43 verses for chapter 3. Six words for William Wordsworth. So in terms of a practice, it's as simple as it is brief. Where am I? Who am I? And what can I offer? The who am I, where am I is important because in one circumstance you may be the CEO and you have certain responsibilities there and there are things you can offer to that environment. But then you go to a conference where you're learning something you've never learned before. There you're not a CEO. There you're just a, a member of the class like everybody else. If you try to act like the CEO in that environment, it's out of place. Where am I and who am I in this environment? Here I'm the Lieutenant Colonel. I'm in charge, I give the orders. There, in the room full of generals, I'm the one who gets told what to do. What can I offer? Simple, simple question. What does this environment need? How can I improve it? If the answer is, there's nothing I can offer. This does not matter. It's the asking of the question that is important. Although in 99% of cases, if the answer is there's nothing I can give, 
it's probably a failure of imagination because there's always something you can give. In this environment, what can you offer? Okay, I can at least not be a disturbing influence for others. Simple, very easy to do. So this is the path of action. The next is the path of devotion. When all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. And then he poetizes. He gets this feeling, this rush of love. And what does he say? Beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched a never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. He's just got this flush of beauty within him. He comes across the daffodils. He's hit with the beauty. He gets this feeling of oneness with this amazing sight and gushes forth this emotion. Imagine going to a concert and seeing 10,000 arrayed in front of you, 10,000 people. And you see them like beautiful daffodils. When all at once I saw a crowd beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Every being is what? This beautiful expression of the consciousness. This is that feeling of oneness that Abu bin Adam was experiencing. So as we practice the service to others, we start to feel this devotion, this universal sense of love. So in terms of a practice, there's a really beautiful phrase that the Swami has in his commentary for chapter 2 of the Gita. He says, Though unknown, you can experience the divinity in the world by tuning in or by feeling the wonder of nature. How does a blade of grass get pushed out of the ground? I don't know. Okay, you can say, well, the sun strikes this and you have geotropism and thigmotropism and so forth and, so on, and that happens and that happens. That's the science, correct. But what kicks that into action? Why does that work that way? Forget that. We're having a conversation. I'm making sounds down here. And understanding is blooming in here. How does that happen? Forget that. There's definitely something going on here. Why is there something instead of nothing? I don't know. The word he uses in this word is ascharya. It means wonderment. So when we tune into this meticulous and inscrutable functioning of the world around us, we have to recognize, I don't know how this is happening. We surrender that egocentric, arrogant perspective of, I know my little piece of the world, and say, there's something larger that I do not know. So tuning into the wonder of nature is a way to develop this devotion. Music, poetry, these are other ways you can do it. You may be familiar with this phrase, music is what emotions sound like. So when the themes of the music or the poetry are universal in nature, they can lift your emotions as well. So at the academy, for example, every day there is devotional singing. You're with your guru bhai, you're with your friends, you're with your compatriots, your comrades, and singing together. You get a lift in your emotions. And your existing religious affiliation, if you have one. So I tell the story of somebody I know who was raised Catholic, and then left the church because of the dogmatism and the other obvious unpleasantness. But at the same time, she felt that she had really lost something of value in her life. The services the beautiful ornate church, the swinging censer, the liturgy in Latin, the beautiful clothing of the priest, the call and response, the group, the community, that was all missing for her. Started studying Vedanta and realized I don't need to buy into the ideology. If I've got something wrong, that's their problem. But I can go now, I can go back to my church and use this beautiful moment of singing and chanting to lift my emotions. So she packaged her Catholicism within this larger project of her self-development. I've got my service, that's my karma yoga. I go to my church, there's my bhakti yoga. And of course the final of the three practices, almost final, penultimate, 
is the path of knowledge. I gazed and gazed. If you're gazing at something, what are you trying to do? I want to see what it is. It's that over there. Is that a person or a post? My eyesight's not what it used to be. I gaze and gaze and gaze at it to try and figure out what it is. This is talking about the intellectual discrimination to try and figure out what's the truth. What is real? Okay, he said real love before. What makes real, real? What makes anything real? What is the truth? Well, I think I've got my truth. In fact, I heard somebody say once, I won't mention who it is. He said, spirituality is all about finding your individual truth. Okay, now the intellect is like a lawyer. You can argue any side that you want, right? But no. Spirituality is about dropping your individual truth because the truth is never ego-centered. The truth is universal, otherwise it's not the truth. So what is true? What is universally real? This is the path of knowledge. Gaze and gaze and gaze into the higher values of life and figure out what really does matter. So from a practical perspective, listening. Listening means reading. It means listening to lectures and so forth. Next step is to reflect. Just because somebody said it, don't believe it. See if it makes sense. Question it. Understand it. Then integrate it. Unselfishness will make me a clearer thinker and a happier person. I understand. I can give you the mechanism by which it works. But it doesn't mean I've integrated it. it. doesn't mean I've become more unselfish. I might be able to talk about it. I might be able to convince you of it. it doesn't mean I'm living it. Reflection precedes the integration as wisdom. So through these three yogas, the three spiritual disciplines, we drop our desires. This is what Sunanaji has been talking about. When we have dropped our desires, we are prepared for the final spiritual practice, meditation. So the word meditation has a thousand different meanings to a thousand different people. Here we use a specific definition of what meditation is. It is single-pointed concentration on a thought to the exclusion of all other thoughts. So when I've heard the Swami discuss this in class, more than once I've seen him say, that even in meditation you have to sometimes, and he grabs his nose, indicating what? If you're in meditation, body consciousness is also gone. What is your body? How do you know your body? You know it through your thoughts. If I step on your toe, you know it. It blooms in your mind as, ah, get off my toe. So even the thought of your own body is gone. A single thought to the exclusion of all others. Try it, just to see that you can't do it. So this is indicated by, he says, For oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude. Vacant means vacant of egocentric, worldly, aggrandizing thoughts. No interest in what the world can provide but pensive, thoughtful on what is real? Who am I? That single thought alone. They flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude. So that inward eye, he's talking about the opening of the eye of wisdom. You get that vision of who you really are. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils which is the final aspect, which is not a practice, this is a state. So when he looked at the daffodils the first time, there was a sense of separation. I'm here, daffodils are there, you are beautiful daffodils. I love you. There's me, there's you. We are separate. Here he says, and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. There's no longer a sense of separation. That beauty that he appreciated in the daffodils, where is it? It's what you said right at the beginning. You've got to find that love within yourself. That beauty in the daffodils, it was never there. It was here all along. So he becomes one with that beauty. He becomes one with the all, is the way he describes it in the commentary. This is the moment of self-realization, where the ego is dissolved, disappears. 
So he says, you find your original self, your original being, is the phrase that Sunanaji used earlier on. So what is this self, what is the original being? For that, we turn to another poem, the Bhagavad Gita. 18 chapters, 701 verses, don't worry, I'm not going to go into it now. <laughs> 